Great, good evening. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the second week of Alpha. Welcome to those of you who are joining online at home and on Facebook as well. It's really super to have you with us um, this evening. Um, if you've not met me before, if you've not joined into this before, my name's Richard England. I'm Vicar of Crofton Parish, uh, and I'll be uh, taking our, our Alpha session this evening. This is the second week of our shortened Alpha course. So we've had last week tonight, and then next week, and then we do take a, a one-week break for half time. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll talk about all the details of those a little bit later. Um, this evening, we're going to be getting into um, the question at the heart of Christianity, which is, who is Jesus? But before you listen to me talk about it, why don't, if you're in the room, turn to the screen and let's see some other people have a go at answering, answering that question. Um... Who is Jesus? I have no idea who Jesus is. I don't know if he exists, but I believe in him. I think it's a person who lived ages ago. Who is Jesus? He is the son of God in the Christian faith. Jesus for me is, uh, is also a prophet. He probably was just some fella who walked around with a beard and pretend to, and a bottle of wine in his back pocket and switched the water with the wine a couple of times and everyone loved him. Jesus to me is somebody we got taught about in infants and junior school really. It's how many million people celebrating his birthday. No one celebrates my birthday like that, so it surely you must have existed. <laughs> Jesus is uh, my God. He's someone that, you know, I can relate to, I can pray to, I can talk to. The Son of God, <laughs> but apparently we are all God's children. So then what is so great about Jesus? There we go. There we go. What is so great about Jesus? My favorite one is, um, I don't know, but I believe in him. That was my favorite. That was my favorite answer. Um, so uh, this evening, we're going to be thinking about who is Jesus. We're going to be thinking about the question, which is at the heart uh, of the Christian faith. Now, um, some people, there are a bit of a range of views about what what is, what is at the heart of the Christian faith? What is right at the center of it? I've heard people say to me, I'm not a Christian because I don't go to church. Uh, to which I often respond, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you a car, uh, that kind of thing. Or I've heard somebody say to me, oh, I'm a Christian because I'm a good person. Or they might say, I'm a Christian because I kind of believe in God. And none of those are bad things. But actually, what is at the heart of Christianity is this question, who is Jesus? And, and we, have a, we have a slightly safer space to explore it this evening. No one's going to suddenly appear uh, with a microphone and a camera and thrust it in your face and I'll get you to answer the question. We're going to have a, take a little bit of time to explore that question um, this evening. But in order to kind of get to this question, we have to kind of roll back a little bit and we have to kind of ask the question, well, did Jesus even exist? I mean, is any of this even true? Is this something that we can, you know, we can, uh, uh, you know, how might we trust whether this person, Jesus, was even a real person? Now, um, if, if you are a little older, it you might surprise you that we have to answer that question because uh, you probably may have grown up in a world that just assumed that, that it was all, uh, it, that it was all true, that it was all real. And, um, but, but actually, that it's not, that's not quite the situation right now. So uh, you may hear people quite often on TV, I quite often hear comedians say this actually, Jesus, if he even existed at all. Or, or we might, you know, perhaps there was somebody who kind of wandered around uh, and was a wandering prophet, but that legends grew up and myths grew up around him that gives us the story that we have today. So, so how could we even know that there was a person called Jesus? After all, it happened, um, it happened kind of a long time ago. Is there anything that we might be able to use to, to, to do that, to answer the question, did he even exist? Well, there is this amazing thing that we can use to answer this question. It's called history. You probably learned it in school. So history is like the record of everything that happened before, um, before yesterday, okay? And, and actually, there, there, are histo there are kind of norms and standards by which we measure history. I have a friend whose dad um, is a historian, teaches history. His dad is not a practicing Christian, 
but is uh, somebody who gets quite annoyed when people say, um, oh, there was no such person as Jesus. Because he gets quite cross about that. Because he says, you get to the point of saying, well, we might as well just throw out all of history. If there aren't any kind of normal ways of learning and understanding about the past, then we might as well give up on whether we can know about anything because his argument is that whether you believe whatever whether you believe in what Jesus says about himself or not that by all normal standards of historical evidence someone called Jesus lived and existed in Judea 2000 years ago now how might we how might we know that well uh, we know that because we have actually eyewitness accounts of his life We have eyewitness accounts. They're recorded in the New Testament. They're called the four Gospels. Uh, And actually, they were all written within um, living memory of Jesus' life himself. So if we we know that Jesus died around about 30 AD, uh, the Gospels were composed at the very earliest by 70 AD. So that's about 40 years later. So that would be like me writing about something that happened in 1980. Yes, 1980 was 40 years ago now. I'm sorry to say that. Um, for those of us for whom it feels much nearer than that. Um, or if uh, the latest, the New Testament, is written by about 90 AD, which would be about me, like me writing something in about, about the 1960s. It's actually, it's in close enough that it's close enough within living memory that the, the documents and the records of the life of Jesus, as they started to be circulated, it would be easy for people to go, that wasn't how it happened. That wasn't how it happened. Um, and that's why, actually, one of the reasons why... Um, I don't, are any of you any, got any Dan Brown fans? Who, have you read the Da Vinci... Anyone read the Da Vinci Code? Yes. Okay, so the Da Vinci Code, this was like a big thing, like a while, about, probably about 15 years ago now. Uh, and this idea that there are other stories of the life of Jesus, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, that tell us the truth that the church suppressed for all these years. It doesn't really work like that. The reason that those aren't in the Bible, the reason that those never became popular and more widely read, was that everybody knew right from the beginning that they weren't true. They were fan fiction fanfic accounts of the life of Jesus that just simply everybody knew that they weren't the truth but actually what we have in the gospels are the truth the record of the account of the life of Jesus and it's not just and actually interestingly you can go and see for yourself the oldest document that we have the oldest fragment I've got I've seen it twice I've got a picture of it here it is here I don't know if you can see that that is the oldest fragment of New Testament that exists in the world. Can you see it? I've circled it in yellow. Okay, that's a photo I took. It's on display in the John Rylands Museum in Manchester. It's actually free to go in. You don't even have to pay to go in. You can go and have a look at it. This is from John chapter 18. Um, and if I, it's in Greek because it was written in Greek. If I were to translate it to you, which I can't because I can't do Greek, it basically broadly says... What, you're, what you would find in John chapter 18 of any Bible that you pick up today. This is from 125 AD. Okay? 125 AD. And what that means is the gap between these things getting written and the first bits of fragments that we have of them is really, really small. It is really, really small. So the, the paper trail, if you like, is really good. But it's not just the Gospels, of course. It's, um, it's also we have the Jewish histories of the time, the Roman histories of the time. The Roman histories of that age all mention this man called Jesus who lived and who, but who was killed by the Romans. And by the time we start to get more popular histories, by about like 200 AD, it's just a given. It's not even a question. It's just a recorded part of the history of that reason, of that region. This is how one, um, one uh, uh, his, historian, uh, biblical scholar puts it. He says, I don't think there's any serious historian who doubts the evidence, the existence of Jesus. We have more evidence for Jesus than we have for almost anybody from his time period. So the historical evidence is good. Who is Jesus? Did he really exist? Okay, well, let's find out. What else can we know about him? Um, What can we know about him as a person? What what do we discover as we we read the accounts of the life 
of the person Jesus. You may well have read, had a go at reading um, some of the, uh, reading one or more of the Gospels. You may be someone that's a, actually been a regular Bible reader over, over the years, or maybe just, you know, at an impulsive moment, you thought you'd have a go at it. I hope you didn't start at the beginning of the Bible because it gets quite heavy going quite early on. But if you had a go at reading the, the accounts of the Gospels, what you'll discover is that actually, fundamentally, Jesus was just someone uh, that, that lived a, a, what we would understand to be a regular human life. He was born, had parents, he had family, he had brothers and sisters, had a slightly turbulent birth. You may, you may well know the story from the Christmas. Um, and he grew up in relative obscurity in a regular family. He had a trade. He followed his dad into the family business. We often think of him being a carpenter, but that kind of makes it sound like kind of fine French furniture or something like that. It would not have, it would not have been that. It would have been like a house builder. He would have been somebody that, that built timber frames for, for, people, for houses for people to live in. That's what a, a carpenter was in those days, not somebody that was going to make you a dresser. Um, so, and, and, he, and he, you know, he lived a fairly normal life up until about the age of 30 when he began his ministry. But even then, we see somebody who, got, who was hungry, who got tired, who fell asleep on a boat and managed to stay asleep in the middle of a storm. Somebody who was happy when um, things went well, when he was excited about what he saw uh, around him. Somebody that got frustrated and angry at people sometimes. We see somebody who, when somebody he loved, died, wept at the graveside. We see somebody who kind of, you know, like we all do, experience the full range of human emotions and human and human life. And yet, in the midst of all of that, somebody who said and did things that marked him out as, as somebody for whom there was something else going on. So, for instance, when people had questions about God, he would not point upwards, but he would point to himself. He would say things like, as we looked at last week, I am the way, the truth and the life. He wouldn't say, hey folks, don't you know that God is the way, the truth, and the life. He would say things like, I am the, I am the bread of life. I am the one who feeds hungry souls, feeds hungry people with something that normal food can't provide. He wouldn't say God is, he would say, I am. He would point to himself. He, this, he would say that he was the one who could forgive people for their sins, for the things that they had done wrong. Whereas everybody knew that the man, only, only God can do that. That was one of the things that got him um, in trouble. He would say things like, I and God, God the Father, are one. It's not that God is up there and I'm down here, that somehow we are one. But let me take you to just one little moment. This is the, the hinge moment around which many of the Gospels, uh, the Gospel stories um, kind of change around this moment. So Jesus has been with his friends for a few years, about a year and a half, and uh, he asked them a question, who do, who do people say I am? Who do all these crowds that come and there's healing and there's all sorts of amazing things, what do they say? Oh, well, they say you're a prophet. They say you're, you know, maybe John the Baptist come back or Elijah. I don't know. Well, you know they say all sorts of things. Who do you say I am? What about you, Jesus asked? Who do you say I am? One of Jesus' disciples, one of his closest friends answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, if you're a good religious leader, you go, no, 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 we've got this all wrong. There's been a terrible misunderstanding. Only God is God and I'm not. We, my job, you know, that's, that's what my job is. My job, I'm a vicar, I'm a religious leader. My job is to help people discover God for themselves, to point towards him, not to point towards me. So he would go, oh, no, 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 you got it all wrong, got it all wrong, got it all wrong. God's God and I'm not. My, my job is to point you to you. But he says, that is exactly right. That is exactly right. You are exactly right. What you have discovered, what you have realized, is not something that you could just work out in your minds. But somehow my heavenly Father has revealed to you, has shown you, helped you to understand that while I'm just like you, I get hungry, I sleep, I get tired like you do. Actually, there is something more, Jesus says, to who I am. He's not just human. There's something more going on. This is how, um, I don't know if you're a U2 fan or not. This is how Bono puts it. 
I don't think you're let off easily by saying Jesus was a great thinker or a great philosopher. Actually, he went around saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified, he said, because, because he said he was the Son of God. So he either, in my view, was the Son of God or he was nuts. Okay, that's Bono's view. How, how would, I wonder how we'd know. How would we answer Bono's question? Um, it's interestingly, um, if, uh, it is a bit of, there is an observable phenom- phenomenon of people who think they are God or of people who think they are Jesus, actually. We have a consultant psychiatrist who is a member of our congregation here, and he would be able to introduce you to some people he's met over his career who think that they are in some way God themselves or, or maybe some kind of reincarnation of Jesus or some other religious figure. It is actually an observable phenomenon. So was he that? Was he that? Or what about the worst alternative? What do are, what are sometimes people do if, to give the impression that they are somehow different or more special than the rest of us? Was he actually kind of a bad person? Was he a cult leader? Is this going to end up in Waco or Jonestown or somewhere like that? Is, that, is this somebody trying to manipulate people who are suggestible? or easily, you know, the poor primitive people that lived in the first century who aren't as enlightened as we modern people are or might believe anyone that says they're God. Is, is it that? How would we, how might we know if he was telling the truth? If the things about which, things that he said about himself might be true or not? What might you, what might a person look for when looking at this person, Jesus, and trying to work out whether this is all true or not. How, how can I know? Let me give you just a couple of things. You can read all about this for yourself in, um, in any one of the Gospels. If you don't have a Bible, we will give you one. We've got various copies of, the gos- of various Gospels that you are really welcome to read. So don't take my word for this. Go and have a look at it for yourself. But first of all, what about his, his teaching? The things he said. We spent all of last year at Holy Rood going through one of Jesus' most famous pieces of teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, where he says things like, turn the other cheek when someone strikes you. He says things like, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He teaches a way of life. Someone once said that basically in 2,000 years, no one has come up with a better way of teaching us how to live than Jesus. No one has been able to better it. If you think about some of the most transformative movements that the world has ever seen, that have transformed our world for the better, not through force, but often by by peaceful means, you will find the teaching of Jesus at the heart of them. We could look at the civil rights movement um, in America. We could look at actually the nonviolent resistance to the communist regimes in places like Romania in Eastern Europe, much of it's whose revolution, whose, whose kind of anti revolution began at the doors of churches. We could look at some of the anti apartheid movements, some of the other uh, trans, tra- we could look at the uh, anti slavery movements uh, against the um, transatlantic slave trade that arose in this country out of the witness of people who were deeply convicted because of their Christian faith that slavery had to be abolished because they were still, hundreds of years later, still being guided by the teaching of Jesus. Now, if he's a fraud, he's a pretty good one. If he's a fraud, he's a pretty good one. But if he's, and if he's bad, then he's doing a terrible job because everything that he said has brought good into the world and he's really got this all back to front. But actually, if he might really be the Son of God, come into the world to do good, then it wouldn't surprise us that nearly 2,000 years later, his words still bring about change in the world. Let's talk about his example. Um, One of the things you will see when you read 
the Gospels is Jesus' care, Jesus' particular care for those who are broken, for those who've been excluded from society, who've been excluded from the religious system of their time. Somehow his ability to offer care and dignity to everyone he meets, to those traditionally excluded by societies in that time, to women, to those who, um, who, were, who were sick, who were poor, those who had been discarded as tax collectors and sinners, not lo- you know, who collaborated with the Romans or who weren't no longer acceptable to the religious system of his time. Somehow finding a way of meeting people where they were and actually setting the table for what we would consider to be uh, normal today, which is the idea that every person you meet has intrinsic worth and value. Every, we, that's just what we consider normal, isn't it? We believe in universal human rights. We believe that everyone you meet has intrinsic worth and value. I promise you that was not what they thought in the first century. That was not what the ancient world, and that's still not what many parts of the world think today. One of the reasons we think that, one of the reasons that is so normal to us is that in this country we've had 1,500 years of Christianity, 1,500 years of reading and retelling the stories of Jesus, looking at his example. It's actually reshaped our view and the value and the dignity of people. This is a little bit of an obscure one, so we'll just gloss over it. But, but for those of you that, love, uh, that would love to dig into the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, if you want to have a look at all of the hundreds of ways in which Jesus' life incredibly fulfills um, these kind of promises, these prophetic promises, um, you know, including multiple things over which he had no control. My favorite one, we looked at it um, over Christmas, is from the book of Isaiah, where the book of Isaiah was written, is about 500 years, five, 600 years before Jesus was born, and speaks of Galilee, of being the place where God would do something special. You can go and visit Galilee today. I hear it's nice. I know that David and Lorna have been there a few times. Is that right? It's a nice place to go. It's, no, it's kind of, it's not that busy, is it? It's quiet, hills, no center of industry. No, not much goes on there. Do you know, in two and a half thousand years since Isaiah said that something special would happen in Galilee, only one special thing has happened there. No big wars, no big industrial revolutions. The only significant thing that's happened in Galilee is that that was where Jesus lived. That's just one example. That was where he was raised. We have predictions about things he could have no control over, like his birth in Bethlehem and all sorts of other things. So there are all sorts of pieces of evidence that what Jesus says about himself might be true. But for the very first generation of Christians, there was one event, one thing, proved it, that proved beyond a shadow of a, of a doubt that everything Jesus said about God and about himself was true. But to find out about that, you're going to have to come back next week. Ha <laughs> ha! There's, yes, I've got good at leaving you all on a cliffhanger. So, um, Here in the building, we're going to have a little break. You're going to get a cup of tea and a cup of coffee, and then we're going to go into our group. Same groups as last time. If you weren't here last week, do just grab um, someone like Beth, and she'll tell you where to go. If you are joining in online and you'd like to join the Zoom group, um, then uh, again, take a little five-minute break. Make yourself go to your kitchen and make yourself a cup of tea or coffee, and then you can join in with the Zoom group, and Dan will be looking forward to seeing you there as well. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining in online. Thank you so much for being here in the building we're going to take a short break and then we're going to go into our groups